My name is Professor Andrew Nix, and I'm the head of the Communication Systems and Networks Group at the University of Bristol in the UK. Together with my colleague, Professor Mark Beach, I'd like to take you through a 25-year journey on our work in channel measurement and modelling. This presentation was originally given at the Brooklyn 5G Summit in April 2014. Our channel measurement and modelling work is used to perform system design and evaluation studies. Our interests are to drive the capacity, the spectral efficiency and the energy efficiency of global standards, such as wireless LANs, as defined by the IEEE 802.11, and cellular and mobile phone systems, as defined by 3GPP. Today, wireless has considerable societal impact. Solutions in health, energy and transport are all reliant on our future communication standards. Historically, we would measure the power of a radio channel. But as the quest to improve the data rate and efficiency has continued, it's become necessary to look at the time and angle dispersion of the radio channel. Angle spread statistics are particularly important when we look at multiple antenna or MIMO communication systems, since they impact on the antenna correlations that we see in the links. It's also important today to look at the detailed structure of MIMO systems, and this includes looking at the time dynamics of the eigenstructure in the matrix MIMO channel. Given the likely adoption of millimeter wave as one of the access technologies in 5G, it is topical to look back on our measurements associated with the narrowband to wideband CDMA debate. Here we employed a sliding correlator spread spectrum sounder to characterize the temporal variations in urban channels at 1.8 gig with a measurement bandwidth of up to 20 megachips per second. This equipment was deployed in Bristol with this picture capturing a measurement campaign on a Sunday morning with horse and shoe Doppler thanks to our Lord Mayor. The key analysis involved looking at the way the rake receiver would actually react to the channel impulse responses for different spreading bandwidths. And what we found was that one megachip per second was unable to excite any rake fingers in our city environment. This activity then led on to a a build, big build collaborative project with the University of Bristol and Bradford, HP Labs and AT&T and we jointly developed an 8 megachip per second direct sequence CDMA demonstrator. Although rather too early in Europe because the great focus was on GSM, this work did pave the way for setting the spreading bandwidth for 3G systems. It is also time to recap on our early work in smart antennas and exploiting the spatial domain of the, the channel, given the re relevance of this technology to millimeter wave access. I think many of you will recall that Bristol was one of the proponents of space division multiple access for enhancing the capacity of cellular networks. And the work of Simon Swells demonstrated a threefold increase in network capacity for an eight element beamformer. This work, like our CDMA work, went on to um, yielding a hardware demonstrator, this time through the EU Race Tsunami project, where we exploited the DECT cordless telephone standard uh, in terms of our donor air interface to actually show the real-time tracking of two users and support of individual traffic streams using SDMA. My work in ray tracing goes back to 1993 with my first PhD student, Georgia Athanasiadou. Georgia worked on our group's second generation image-based ray tracers. These models had a number of limitations. For example, the databases were quite simple by today's standards. The terrain had to be flat. Propagation was mainly limited to the horizontal plane. And we weren't modeling polarization uh, in these early models. But notwithstanding, we could still generate some impressive outputs. You can see in the coverage maps here, that we were able to predict power an RMS delay spread as a user walked throughout a city environment. Early work looked at the sensitivity of our ray models. How many reflections? How much diffraction? Uh, was transmission important? Were all questions that we were asking at that time. We also started working on comparing our predictions with measurements. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner one of our first comparisons of a predicted and a measured power delay profile. This work led to a number of publications in the IEEE transactions. Uh, two examples are shown in the top right-hand corner. 
As well as outdoor, we also did some work on indoor modelling, and here you can see one of our early databases. We found that our predictions was really sensitive to the position and location of the objects. It was also quite difficult to generate the databases for indoor environments. Based on our work, we found that it was actually much easier to use our indoor models to produce statistical data sets and to use this to actually inform system design. In 1994, we started working on a more scalable model that could overcome some of the limitations I mentioned earlier. This picture actually shows the database used in our current tools. The data is obtained from a laser scan generally performed from an aircraft. The red objects represent three-dimensional buildings, the green objects represent trees, and the underlying colour codes represent the terrain height. In this model we can drop users anywhere onto the ground, and access points can be placed on the ground, on lampposts, on the sides of buildings, or on the tops of buildings. We can model single antennas or multiple antennas and arrays. We've even recently modified the tool so that we can fly an aircraft over the city and produce channels for the air-to-ground and ground-to-air links. Our wide area modelling work was performed by Eustace Tomei over the period from 1994 to 2007, although we're still making improvements even today. The model differs from our earlier image-based ray tracers through its use of rough surface radar cross-section theory. Basically, we use a scatter model to represent the interactions with the surfaces in the database. This allows us to scale really effectively, and also as we're looking now towards the millimetre waves that are of interest to uh, 5G, uh, actually uh, a rough surface model is very appropriate. So in the early days, we did a lot of work comparing the outputs of our model with measurements and looked at different settings. In particular, the uh, validation results shown here you can see that the blue and green traces are, uh, compare really well. And the blue is when we turn the 3D features on in our model. If we ran a small simplified two-dimensional model, we actually see some very significant underprediction because significant multipath scatter components are then missing. On the left-hand side of the uh, slide, you can see the double-directional spatial data that comes out of our model. You can basically see the azimuth and elevation spreads at both the base station and the mobile. This double directional data has become really important for MIMO systems and also as we're looking also towards beamformers and, uh, and, and the like in, uh, in 5G. Of course, we're also able to predict the wideband impulse responses um, out of these kind of tools. So this particular model became known as Prophecy and was licensed to a number of companies and organisations. Another thing that we were able to do with this model is to take the output channel predictions and combine them with measured antenna patterns and simulations um, of radio standards. So the animation in the top right hand corner is showing how an 802.11 hotspot would operate um, in an area of the campus uh, in Bristol. You can see as the user walks around the streets and turns corners, we're predicting how the modulation and coding and the MIMO schemes need to adapt to maintain a high quality of performance. So this work has, uh, has led to a number of publications. Um, I've shown two in this slide here. One is looking at the impact on low-frequency radar and exploits the ability to fly an aircraft over central London and to look at how that uh, radar system may interfere with digital television. Uh, a second paper here is looking at the joint shadowing process in a city environment. Again, this kind of model is able to look at um, um, basically peer-to-peer -peer type communications which are becoming very relevant now with the interest in device-to-device -device applications. In 1999, we decided to revisit the area of indoor propagation modelling. We wanted to produce a true multi-floor 3D indoor model with the aim of producing large statistical data sets that we could use to start to optimise uh, emerging radio standards such as Wi-Fi. So as you can see in this particular animation, as a user walks around a particular room, we're able to trace in 3D all of the multipath components uh, to that particular unit. What was interesting back then was to see whether or not the spatial and temporal data actually aligned with what was seen in practice. So, using some of Mark's measurement equipment, we were able to measure the uh, power delay profile and the power azimuth spectrum as a user moved along a particular route. And that's what produces the, uh, I guess, the, the measured uh, pictures shown in this slide. You can then see next to them the predicted 
power delay profiles and power azimuth spectrum. And again, you can also see that it's possible the model is replicating the detailed multipath structure, not just the direct paths, you know, the strong red components in the pictures, but also the weaker scattered components, which actually do play an important part in the overall channel process. In 2012, we started working with Vancom in the UK to produce a design and verification process for Wi-Fi products. And this was actually based on our indoor propagation models. We would take a, a product under test, a router, a set-top box, even a dongle, and then measure each of the antenna patterns in our anechoic chamber. So we'd spin it around in all directions and produce these kind of 3D complex voltage and polymetric patterns that you can see in the, in the bottom right-hand corner. By combining measured antenna data with predicted channel multipath data, we're able to produce a combined antenna channel model, which is actually what we want to look at the performance of our products. So these combined models can then be uh, dropped into our system level simulators, 802.11n and AC in this case, or they can be loaded into the Electrobit C8 emulator shown in the picture. And then we can do hardware in the loop, conductive testing. Most important is our conductive testing actually includes the embedded measured antenna patterns. Um, and this allows us to get real insight into the performance of the product. By placing access points and, and Wi-Fi uh, clients in all the different rooms of the houses and looking at all our combinations, we can generate millions and millions of links and to produce truly statistically relevant performances uh, to how good a particular product is. If you'd like to know a little bit more about this area, then I would encourage you to take a look at the YouTube video. Obviously, the link is shown on the, on the slide. Um, and there, I'll take you through a little bit more of the process over uh, a three or four minute video clip. Where were you when Bell Labs stated that they'd broken the Shannon limit? Well, we were certainly listening and wondering how all the maths would apply to real channels and were the gains in spectrum efficiency attainable through spatial multiplexing truly realisable? We set out through the work of Darren Mamaras who modify our CMO channel sounder and use these antenna arrays to look at the MIMO capacity of our undergraduate engineering laboratory at Bristol. The results which were first shown in VTC um, 4 in 2000 show that capacity enhancement was certainly possible for our 8x8 system but this fell a little bit short of the IID Rayleigh theoretical results. We continue to use our MIMO channel sounder to explore the signalling space of our 8x8 system and how the temporal variability of the individual SISO channels impacted the overall performance and most importantly extracted the Eigen uh, channel matrix structure and how this varies with both time and motion. We can clearly see significant variation in the channel gains and the signal to noise ratio across the different eight uh, Eigen streams that we exploited from our measurements and this accounts for the differences between the measured and predicted performance of MIMO systems. In 2003, we started work on a new outdoor model with a new PhD student, Ka Heng Ung. This particular model was looking to improve accuracy, but over maybe smaller areas. We still had the irregular terrain features, and actually um, Ka Heng introduced some quite complex um, multiple diffraction interactions between rooftop and corner uh, interactions within the, within the city. We also added some rough surface scatter um, concepts into the model, which again used some of the ideas um, from the tools you saw earlier. This particular tool was developed with MIMO right from the very beginning in mind. So we were able to, um, to predict not just um, spatial structures and, and, and um, wideband um, temporal data, but also things like um, the matrix channel and the eigenstructure, the theoretic capacity that could be achieved out of MIMO systems. And this led um, to the transactions paper shown here in 2007, which we believe is the first time that anyone published a site-specific comparison between measured MIMO data and predicted MIMO data. Uh, so this model um, was very successful. However, the complexity of the vector data and the complexity of the ray analysis limited its applications to areas up to about two kilometers by two kilometers. The quest to understand the MIMO channel led to a body of work addressing the double directional channel measurements through the work of Chaw Min Tan. Here we built and characterized two 16 element circular arrays which were going to be used at 
5.2 gigahertz. And the type of characterization we conducted allowed the individual element patterns of the measurement arrays to be de-embodied from the post-process results. We took these arrays and deployed them in our courtyard outside our building. And what we can see in this little video is the direction of departure and direction of arrival of the signal paths with the larger dots indicating the stronger signal strength. Clearly can be seen there's a high directionality component in terms of the way the two ends of the link connect together. Clearly we wish to take our work exploring the spatial domain further and take our measurement rig in, into cellular-like deployments. However, given the um, measurement time involved, um, we had to restrict our analysis to angular arrival at the user end of the communications link. And this particular activity was done at 2 gigahertz for an outdoor cellular environment. This time we used a mobile trials vehicle to actually carry the, uh, the measurement system, as you can see in this, this video. And again, we post-processed the results to de-embed the individual antenna patterns of the measurement array and plotted these in terms of direction of arrival, time of flight, and signal strength as indicated by the um, colored dots on the screen. From our trial results, what we found is that the angle uh, of arrival and the spread is certainly not uniform over 360 degrees and varies considerably from line of sight, non-line of sight, oblique line of sight, and if you are perpendicular or right angles to the actual cell site. We have mentioned several times during our talk the importance of the composite antenna and the propagating media. Our first detailed exploration of this important aspect of wireless connectivity was at 2 gigs for a 4x4 MIMO system. What we employed were two um, dual polarised um, panel antennas at our transmitting end, giving us four transmit ports, and three different receiver configurations, a laptop with four PFAS, a smartphone type configuration with four slot antennas, and a reference configuration with four um, head-worn sleeve dipole antennas. Our hardware was um, deployed uh, in the city of Bristol and multiple walking and standing uh, measurements were taken in the city. We also conducted a few vehicular trials using this equipment. From the data that we collected, we looked at properties such as the coherence time of the eigenvalues and also the coherence bandwidth um, of, of these uh, particular channel properties. It's rather interesting. From, we also experienced a phenomenon known as the grip of death. So our 4x4 system should show four distinct eigenvalue traces, but sometimes when we're using our slot antenna-based smartphone, unfortunately the odd thumb seemed to creep over one of the antennas and completely deafen that channel off as shown in this illustration here. We also process the results in terms of coherence time, um, coherence bandwidth, again of the eigenvalues, and these results were fed into the WiMAX standardization process by our project partner Fujitsu. The work was also used in establishing some of the, um, the uh, feedback rates and the latency in the codebook structure that was used actually in the early WiMAX deployments for MIMO. So our latest MPhD student, Jamal Baraki, is currently working on our millimetre wave uh, simulators. These are, as you can see in the picture down here, um, lamppost based, uh, looking at access and uh, backhaul in a street environment. The indoor models are also compatible with the 11AD environment scenarios uh, defined by that particular YGIG standard. Again, interesting points to pick out. Uh, we model all first and second order uh, reflections with full polarisation. We also model the scattering effect and the transmission losses through the trees. The uh, antenna modelling is very accurate with full 3D complex voltage and polarimetric uh, modelling. We support vertical, horizontal, left and right circular polarisations. The antennas can be um, both directive um, in terms of fixed and or steerable. Uh, and we simulate, for example, a range of codebook algorithms. 
we have a dynamic simulation as shown in the uh, in the video where we're able to have humans moving around using random waypoint models these can move around in both the indoor and the outdoor environments now and again interestingly we have combined the outputs of the ray tracer both the um, power and the time uh, spatial information through what's known as the receive bit mutual information rate abstraction model to model the y gig standard uh, and modifications of that standard for um, backhaul with and without dynamic beam forming and this represents some of our most recent work and uh, for example two papers were published uh, in istanbul uh, earlier uh, earlier this month um, on some of these aspects so this slide shows some of the recent work we've been doing with uh, NSN in Chicago. Uh, we've been looking at propagation statistics for both macrocells and picocells using the um, prophecy model from Eustace to May. Here we've been using databases of both Bristol and London, uh, as I showed you earlier. So for the base station, for the macro station, macrocells, we basically deployed 23 different base station positions in order to get statistical relevance. For the picocell, we deployed um, 600 different uh, base stations and then for each base station we connect a whole range of users as shown in here. It ends up with many tens of thousands of, of, of connections uh, that we're then able to statistically average over in order to produce uh, useful input data. So looking at some of the um, the results that came out of this particular work we looked at for example the the angle bias the mean angle between a mobile uh, and the base station and how that varied for pico and macro cells and also for london and bristol that's shown in this data here we see that the uh, the average angle is again distance dependent similarly the the elevation or the variance around the mean angle is also very strongly distance dependent and these two parameters were um, encapsulated statistically and uh, put forward into the new 3gpp 3d channel model uh, in particular this information was summarized in a joint paper with msn which was published in berlin uh, and uh, last summer. We also did a little bit of work uh, on outdoor to indoor modeling and the impact of user height. Uh, this is due to be uh, published uh, later this year. Our very latest um, work, uh, which we've uh, just been just been uh, finishing, has been looking at uh, the LT Advanced Standard and how, again, we can look at um, multi-stream MIMO evaluation. So here you see, for example, um, the probability of how many streams can be driven between the base station and a user. Um, so we're considering uh, a number of different uh, scenarios um, from 8x8 MIMO to 16x8 MIMO, the higher number at the base station. We've looked at different array geometries, whether they should be spaced horizontally and vertically, and the impact of the different antenna spacings. And as you can see in the statistics ticking along in this uh, little animation, uh, as you might imagine, um, it is uh, possible to now exploit the elevation statistics uh, in, particularly in PICA cells, in order to get pretty good MIMO performance. We we're also very interested in looking at the uh, importance of uh, having more antennas at the base station and how this may improve the probability of getting higher numbers of spatial streams and therefore statistical data rates to the users. So Mark and I would like to end by just giving you a little bit of an insight into what we're looking at doing in, uh, in the area of 5G and beyond. And um, one of our major activities is putting together a city scale living lab this is something that we're doing, uh, working with a number of partners, including the Bristol City Council. The idea is to have uh, an advanced uh, research capability in 5G based off the 70 kilometers of dark fiber that we have running across the city. Also looking at heterogeneous wireless deployments of uh, LT advanced Wi-Fi and millimeter wave, both for access and uh, backhaul. The uh, combination of our terabit optical backhaul and uh, obviously uh, the, the wireless technologies is going to be utilized to look at software-defined networking uh, and its integration, so particularly things like uh, virtualization and how we can make the different uh, radio interfaces appear agnostic to the core network, even though they're coming from different vendors and are actually different technologies. So as you've seen, we believe that software-defined networking, uh, the principles and methodologies involved, are a key enabler for the interworking of heterogeneous access technologies um, with the optical core network. Uh, in order to drive forward in this area, we've just secured uh, a government uh, EPSRC program grant. Uh, it's called Toucan, and it has a value of somewhere in the order, including um, um, hardware uh, donations of 15 million US dollars. Uh, the idea is that we'll be uh, looking to develop SDN control and virtualization techniques and actually put it into practice at city scale. The millimeter wave is also a, a very key area of where Bristol's going uh, into the into the near future. So to further developing some of the models that I've shown you in order to uh, provide planning capabilities, but also a better understanding of the complex interactions between the channel and the antenna. Um, so a, a, a program of uh, measurements and modeling is certainly um, currently being uh, being planned. And obviously we're looking to combine this data 
than with our physical layer capabilities uh, in order to be able to practically assess what is possible and what kind of um, capacities and interference um, approaches we'll be able to generate. Okay, well, thank you very much. That concludes our, um, our, our presentation this morning. Um, I would also like to leave you with a list of names of, uh, of the people that have uh, obviously contributed in, uh, in various ways to the um, content and material that we've uh, covered uh, during this presentation.